What's up, Reptile family? I'm really excited to bring you this new series, Morph Market in Action. Today in episode one, we are gonna talk with Tom Harbin. Tom has been breeding reptiles for four decades and is also a veterinarian. We are gonna cover a lot of exciting topics, including how to import your breeders into Morph Market and how to set up breeding plans. Please let us know what you think in the comments below and what questions you would like us to ask future guests. This is just the first episode and we have a lot more coming, so stay tuned. I created Morph Market in 2015 because I found the existing online services to be inadequate for the reptile hobby and wanted something better. Since then, it's been a crazy journey as Morph Market has grown to become the online platform for the reptile community. Some of my best experiences have been meeting with breeders and keepers to learn how we can better serve them. Morph Market in Action is a video series where I invite you into these conversations. Together with some amazing guests, we will dive into the platform and learn how to use it most effectively. Along the way, you'll get to meet some of our favorite people and learn from their successes. So, Tom, you got into breeding about 40 years ago, it sounds like, breeding reptiles. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, this year, I'll be 71. I turned 70 last year, but I've had snakes as long as I can remember. You know, we've been married 49 years this year, and I had snakes for years before we got married. And so it's always been a part of our life, you know. But you don't look a day over uh, 52, so hey, you're doing very you, well, bro. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you know, not only I know that you're a veterinarian also, and you do reptiles and other animals also, but did, which came first? Were you a vet first and then you got into breeding or, or, or the other way around? Uh, the other way around, I was breeding um, long before I even got in vet school. I mean, you know, back in the day we would catch wild snakes, you know, and we'd try to find eggs, you know, and all that. But uh, I think when the first albino corn snake hit the market, that really caught my attention. And so, probably for a lot of others too. But, uh, you know, I was breeding king snakes, corn snakes, hog nose, you know, uh, back in the seventies. So that goes back a day or two. Before it got real popular, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it did. You know, that was just sort of where I got lost as a kid. You know, I, I was very fortunate to be raised in uh, Mobile County, which is South Alabama. There are two counties, one in Western Alabama, one in Eastern Mississippi, where the black, uh, the black pine snake occurs. And so, I didn't know they were rare when I was a kid. We went out and caught them, you know, brought them home, put them in the garage. And it, it goes back a ways and just, uh, it was just always a part of my life. I remember when I was, not to not to date myself too, but I must have been maybe, yeah, early 90s or mid 90s when I was in high school. And I got the, probably it was Reptiles Magazine. And I would always see those different colored corn snakes. And I didn't know much about it at the time, but I thought that was the coolest thing. Oh, yeah. And oh, I yeah. had no idea one day I'd be more involved in it um but that's cool so you became a veterinarian later after that was that motivated somewhat by the reptile keeping yeah i'm sure it was you know because uh, my parents just really encouraged it, there was sort of a, a a contradiction there because uh it was rare that they would take and spend money on an animal at the veterinarian you know I mean, it was unheard of taking a, a dog to the vet and spending $15, you know, that was expensive. So that sort of fueled my jets, you know, I said, you know, I'm going to do something about this. And so I always wanted to be a veterinarian and the reptiles fed that fire. And uh, the fact that my family, just the culture they were raised in, they didn't spend money on animals. And so what does it look like? How is your breeding which began as a hobby how has that changed over the decades up to present it has always been um an endeavor of passion it, it's always been an endeavor of learning um when i began to learn about genetics you know which drives this whole industry uh when it comes down to the bottom line genetics just really lit a fire in me and uh even in high school i was studying genetics back then and uh uh, so the more I knew, the the more I was determined, you know, to uh, to work with something that uh, that really was fun and just visually had the big wow factor, you know. So uh, so so that began in high school. I had some great teachers in high school, you know. They really sort of spurred us on and made us think and introduced us to some stuff that that I had no idea uh, was out there. I understand you breed other animals besides reptiles, also. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I do, you know, Sarah and I. Um, she was raised on a dairy farm so it's it's been in her blood all of her life to be around animals and so when we moved back to alabama uh, we bought a little farm down here uh, south of montgomery alabama we have 60 acres we have a registered goat herd we sell reproductive stock uh for boar goats which are meat goats 
Uh, we have a small herd of cows, like five, very small. We have turkeys. In fact, I checked my turkeys this morning. We've got turkey eggs, actually. We've got two uh, hens, you know, sitting on eggs right now. And, uh, you know, it, it does, it just doesn't end. My grandkids that my youngest son has, they raise crusty geckos. Um, mm -hmm. I was on the phone last night with my older son and his wife. She's a veterinarian and, and they're doing hog nose and ball pythons. And so, you know, it looks like it's going to carry on in the family. That's fantastic. Love the generational effect. Yeah, it's, it's got to help you when you have, you know, all that veterinarian background and then you've bred so many different kinds of animals. I've got to think that learning about the different types of animals helps you. It all carries over to some extent. Yeah. The husbandry it, and the keeping and breeding. Well, it has to, you know, now the majority of the exotic pets that come into the practice that I'm associated with right now, and, and probably most people know this, but you know, 90, 95% of the issues that I deal with are created by the keeper because mm -hmm. they don't provide adequate husbandry, you know, and so a lot of my time is spent asking questions and, you know, digging in and, you know, so we can solve a lot of problems just by having a conversation and discovering what they might not be doing in an optimal situation, you know? So, mm -hmm. well, that's a lot of fun too. And it does help too. And, and I don't mean this in a critical way at all in the academic arena, like in a vet school or university, um, it is much more academic than it is practical. And so for me, having the background that I've got, having kept reptiles and bred reptiles, you know, I've bred Gila's, I've bred tortoises, I've bred, you know, caimans. Uh, I mean, it, it goes way back. Rabbits, whatever you want to say, it's on that list. Um, it, it does add value to my interaction with my clients, I think, and the keepers that I work with for me to be a keeper also. Something that transpired starting about two years ago, I went up and did a couple of um, club demonstrations at the uh, Auburn University Vet School. And so as things grew, they invited me last year to uh, be on staff. And so I'm up there teaching one class right now on reptile reproduction and genetics. And uh, so that that's just a heck of a lot of fun. You know, so this Thursday, I'll be going over uh, Thursday afternoon and we'll be doing a ultrasound lab with about 25 students up there. So, you know, I, I could do that every day and never get bored. So it has morphed and grown into you know, something much bigger. Um, it, it's odd to me. And I think I said this with someone else uh, last week or two, but um, it's odd to me that in large cities that people can't find a reptile veterinarian that they're comfortable with. I had a snake shipped to me from Los Angeles about a month ago that their vet just never has seen anything like it. And so um, they sent it to me and um, we did some diagnostics and ended up the, the snake had cancer. Unfortunately, we ended up having to put that animal to sleep. Um, so I think my background in husbandry and being a keeper, you know, being a hobbyist, uh, mm -hmm. a serious hobbyist, uh, it goes hand in hand dovetails with my uh, veterinary medicine. One thing I was going to say, if he's right in what I was going to say, which is if someone's in Alabama area or maybe even further, like I can't yeah. think of a better veterinarian that I would want to take my reptiles to than somebody who's who loves them and has spent decades working with them. So, yeah. and that's hard to find, right? It is so, hard. Uh, well, shifting gears, um, let's talk about Morph Market. You know, Tom Harbin, Reptiles and Morph Market. Tell me, when did you, maybe maybe when did you first hear about Morph Market and then when did you start to really use it? Well, you know, I should have looked up that information before we uh, we got to talking, but I think I was one of the founding, is that how, how it stated on there? Uh, so I've got a couple of batches on there. I've yep, been you're, you're a founding member from 2017. 2017. At least your, yeah, your store, it looks like early 2017 is when your store was registered. Okay. You know, uh, before that, you know, kingsnake.com and fauna classifieds and, you know, just going to shows and, um, and we knew that those things were falling short uh, by quite a bit. And uh, so when I was introduced to Morph Market, and honestly, it was probably at one of the larger shows, maybe Tinley, somebody said, if you heard of Morph Market, they're wearing a t-shirt, you know. And uh, I said, no, but I'm going to find out about that. So uh, it's just been an integral part of my, um, you know, marketing tools that are available there, the the, the storefront. It, there's nothing out there that that works like it and, and works as well and gets me out in front of people in such a simple way that people can contact me. So recently, you and I were talking about all the new features we've been adding that have expanded the Morph Market platform beyond just the, a place where you can put listings for animals for sale into a full animal management system, uh, something where you can create breeding plans, track your offspring, your clutches, soon to track some of that breeding activity. 
where users can go and see the the plans you're creating, the clutches that are coming, and soon be able to even waitlist those animals or combos that you, that you think are maybe coming or ones that you might create. And so I'm curious, what when when I share all of that, you know, some of that again, which is out, some of it was coming soon. Which of those features sound most exciting to you in your hobby slash business? Well, I think as you and I have talked, um, one of the real exciting, one of the things that goes way back when Ralph Davis was, you know, kind of the guy. He had um, on his website, he had what was for sale, but he also, every clutch he had, he posted it on there with pictures. And man, he got a bazillion views on that and, and just introduced the whole world to a lot of stuff. And so when we can do that on Mark Market, I mean, people already stalk, you know, um, a, a lot of people's morph market pages, including mine. And uh, when we're able to do that, to introduce them to what's coming and what date to expect to see pictures, you know, on morph market, and they can see every clutch that I hatch and what mm -hmm. my plans are for the future. I think that is just out of this world. Uh, it, it's going to create a lot of excitement and a lot of business on top of that, you know, to be able to wait list people. We haven't wait listed people in years, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you'd have to get on a wait list, you know, and uh, you would send them 25 bucks, you know, and, but the wait list, when we get that and when, once they see what the potential is and it takes it out of my hands too, when I put my information in, I don't have to keep a notebook over here that I've got to go back and look for or lose, you know, um, mm -hmm. That, or leave it at a snake show, you know, kind of thing. So uh, it's really exciting that this can be all digitized and all in one place. Uh, mm -hmm. I like my system now. Um, on my tubs, I've got a breeding three by five card. Once the babies hatch out, they have their own three by five card for feeding and shedding and, you know, all of that stuff. Then I have another notebook. When they breed, I write down the male, the female, what date the eggs were laid, how many eggs were laid. So now, mm -hmm. I don't have to keep 16 notebooks. It's going to streamline a lot of things. So I'm excited about all the things that you have mentioned. Uh, I think you even mentioned that potentially someday coming with a point of sale, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yep. and that, that just has not really been done. When, when I was maintaining my own website, uh, my dad mm -hmm. helped me do that. And we had a point of sale on there, you know, once Morph Market came along, man, I let that baby die, you know? So, uh, I don't maintain a website anymore. We're really excited to bring in, as you mentioned, Ralph Davis, and we can think of him, we can think of other big breeders who have had the resources to build custom websites that cost thousands of dollars in order to track all the lineage, in order to have even a well, point of sale, you could probably get that in, in kind of off the shelf type websites now, but anything custom related to genetics, waitlisting, clutch tracking, litter tracking, that's really expensive to build that. And so we're excited to be able to produce that for the whole industry so that it's accessible to every breeder, even if you're the biggest or you're the smallest, you know, for a reasonable price. Right. It's, it's very exciting. And, you know, the fee that we pay uh, to you to Mark market for the value that we get, it's just incredible. We could not do this on our own, you know, without, like you say, spending thousands of dollars and we wouldn't have a product like you've got, uh, it, it would not come close. So. I'm very happy with with what the work you're doing. And that's the beauty of the uh, software is really expensive to build. We spend a more for spend a lot of money to build this stuff and to, to continue to improve it, refine it, change it. However, because it's such a well, it's not a large community, but there are thousands of breeders right. supporting and all pulled together. It does produce enough resources to build you know, the platform. So Absolutely. it's uh, Absolutely. kind of, we're all, all doing it together. Well, one of the, you know, I talked to you a, a few weeks ago, really about this and, you know, one of the barriers that we're aware of to, mm -hmm. you know, breeders like yourself are listing their, their, you know, some percentage of their hatchlings every year and selling them. Okay. But there is a barrier, at least maybe a psychological one, uh, maybe a, a concern of unknown and difficulty of like, what is it? I mean, I've got a hundred, 200 breeding animals. That sounds like a ton of work to get those in the system. Part of why we're doing this series is to just uh, show that it's not that hard to educate on how a breeder, different options a breeder has to get their data into the system so that they can start to unlock those features of the clutches, the plans, the lineage, and all that stuff. That's what uh, you know we've just gone through. So I want to jump in and start to look at the website and, and discuss with you what it took for you to get set up um, to where you're at. And uh, hopefully that will be uh, helpful to others. Sounds good. And I'm still learning too. So I'm anxious to learn some more myself. So here is your store page. 
which is basically like your homepage on Morph Market. Right. Um, and there and there's that coveted founding member badge that you've got. There you uh, go. For continuous support since 2017 and 18 badges. Look at all that from things wow. you've likes and uh, follows and memberships and USR gold member. Something else that's neat that not everyone knows about is that we have events on Morph Market. And so we can see that you're going to be attending uh here in about three weeks so that's that's cool too and uh of course now you've, you've got your listings and now because of what we've done recently you got your collection here on the site also i love that i love it uh one thing i'm gonna do um i went through and took those pictures fairly quick and downloaded them which was seamless it was just so easy um i will go back and take better pictures and sub in some nicer pictures you know along the way but but at mm -hmm. least people get a flavor of what I'm working with. I like how you um, just kind of did a first pass just to get it up there because this is better than than not having that presence at all. And then sure, you can always change and update your photos, but these look good anyway. So let's talk about what it took to get your collection in the system. We have, so this is Google Sheets. Google Sheets is like, a, it's a spreadsheet like my, uh, Microsoft Excel, uh, which may, probably sounds intimidating to a lot of people, but you know, sheets are actually really easy to use. It's just columns and rows and you just put values in the cells here. But I said, it doesn't matter. You know, a breeder doesn't really have to understand all of that. Let me ask you first, historically, how have you added animals to Morph Market over the past couple of years? I have not used this method yet to create a sheet or a spreadsheet and import it. Uh, mm -hmm. I've done it one animal at a time, the very slow and you know, it's not tedious necessarily, but thank goodness I just hatch out about 40 clutches a year. And mm -hmm. so when a clutch hatches, it, it's not a big deal to just put in six, eight, 10 animals, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, but uh, after this experience, it's going to be much easier, I think, for me to uh, get up uh, importing, you know, a spreadsheet and then just add the, add the photos. I, I love being able to add a photo within, you know, um, once I get it on Morph Market, mm -hmm. I just pop, 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 and you know I've got good Wi-Fi um, where I uh, have my snake room, and um, it, it takes no time at all to put twenty pictures in. A point that I like to make is that you know breeders who upload say dozens or maybe even a hundred hatchlings a year, they're doing a basically creating a hundred animals a year, and yet they feel that adding a hundred or two hundred breeders they don't have time for. But the reality is they're already doing a hundred a year. And uploading your breeders, of course, you're going to rotate through your breeders. Mm -hmm. And so every year you're going to add, remove some, but it's kind of a fixed cost. It's like a one time, more or less a one time investment. And then you can make, you know, be benefit from that for you really years to come. So it's really not, it shouldn't be even doing it the slow way, quote unquote, the slow way shouldn't be too intimidating if you think about it in, per in the long term perspective. But that being said, there's a much, there's a quicker way to, to bulk import. And that's what we did with you. So I provided you with this uh, Google sheet. And I just said in this sheet, I kind of shaded it. So the, the dark columns, you kind of just focus on the light stuff. We really, really the critical information we want to have is, you know, is it an adult? Most of them will just be adults. So that's done. So the sex, the title, which includes the genetics, and then some animal ID, which we can generate automatically. And in your case, you had IDs but if someone didn't, let's say their name was, you know, Breeder Bob, we could, if we want to prefix that, all the IDs is BB, we just change that. And then we just set the status to not for sale and we make it a public or private or, or whatever we want. So, so really what I asked you to do was just to go down the list here and put in the, t the sex and the title and, and your ID number since you had one. And how long did that take you to populate this list? And you've got uh, 157 animals here. You know, maybe two hours. Did you have some other lists you were looking at, or did you kind of look at your tubs and their title cards on them? Yeah, um, I, I'm old fashioned, but I, I looked at the tubs, and when I got one in, I put a little piece of orange tape on the tub, moved to the next one, and uh, that way it, it gave me the assurance of completion. Let's just say that I had, and I do use, uh, you know, uh, sheets. I use uh, Google Sheets uh, for other things. And uh, but I didn't want to count on me having made that a complete list, but doing it the you know tagging with tape, I was one hundred percent sure that I had everything in there. Once you've got this in, and 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 I'll just make a side note: there were a couple IDs that were duplicated, and so the system kicked that back. But that was it. It just told us the line number where there was a problem, and we went 
and corrected it. But you could go a couple ways you could get this into Morph Market. One would be to download the uh, Excel format, and then you can upload it. I like to just highlight these cells, and I do a uh, you just copy it. So from the Animal Manager, we just click on the Import button, and from here we can paste in that data and click import this is cool because this is a, a feature we add we an enhancement we added to import really only about a year to two years ago because we've had this feature since 2015 we made some improvements in the last couple of years and one was to support very large imports because if some breeders were importing hundreds of animals at once and it would be too slow to process in the normal way so now if it's more than 50 animals it'll actually go into the background and let us know it's in progress and really it should only take a minute or two and then we can see now here are all those animals that have been imported and we've got the titles the ids you know there's no price set it's not for sale public with the sex the maturity uh and it's got the, the when we updated it and we've got the genetics as well so you know a breeder i don't know if you looked yet tom but you should definitely scan through sometimes you know the system does its best to extract the genetics from the titles it makes some mistakes sometimes there are some some ways of saying things it doesn't understand so you always want to scan that but by and large it's, it's pretty good and it's getting better all the time so yeah, you know if you were to if, if if you were like actually this is a posset clown you can just click on that a lot of people don't know but the animal manager and this is something we were talking about a second with the photos and we'll get back to but you can click on most of these values and change them right here so you don't kind of like a, a sheet people who like sheets love them because you don't have to go to another page it's all in one spot so in the same way, we don't have to go to the other page. We can just click on this. We could change clown to het clown, just like that. And, and then we could refresh the title if we wanted to. Now, once you imported, you okay. said you went through and, and a feature you didn't know about and a lot of breeders don't, again, is that you can click on this page. So we can click right on the thumbnail here and you can do this on your phone. I recommend importing with the computer, although it could be done with the mobile phone, and then taking your phone and walking around your reptile room. And in this case, I'm choosing a pre-existing photo. We're going to, I don't know what this is. Just upload some animal photo here. And there it is. That happened to be a spider. You can have your mobile phone out in your reptile room. And you can actually sort this by animals with, you can click it twice. So it's going to put the animals without images at the top. Now you can just click on you know, the first one, you could either sort it by ID if your room is organized by the IDs and you're going to go through the room that way. You could do that. In this case, I'm going to filter down to all the animals with the TH ID because those are those were yours and I had some other animals in here before. Right. So now we could go around the room and just click on the photo and on the phone on the computer, it's going to ask me you know, what photo to upload. But on the phone, it would also give you an option to take the photo. So right. basically you touch on the photo, you take the photo. You go to the next one and and and, pro and go all the way the, around the room. Now, what process did you use to get the photos in? Once I discovered that there was one or two of the animals that it did not pick up all of the genetic traits. So I did a combination of thumbnail and then also touching on the yellow, you know, uh, the animal uh, ID, uh, not the ID, but the animal name, like Pied mm -hmm. Carlton. Um, mm -hmm. So... And, and then I've actually gone back again and made sure that all of my genetic uh, information was accurate. So, but mm -hmm. it was, you know, it was 99% accurate, but it missed one or two, but that drives mm -hmm. me crazy. I want it to be right, you know? So, uh, right. that was an easy thing to do. If this, whatever Pi Carl says, I don't even know what that is, but if we click on this, let's say this also was, well, let's say it was Het Pied. We just kind of looked at this a second ago, but let's just see how we could have done this. So without going to that other screen, we could have just gone here, changed the Gen X and save title, and it would just update the title for us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's easy. That's easy. If that's now, the only thing you needed to change. Okay. You said something a minute ago about you click something twice to get the animals mm. that don't have a picture. How did, what, what did that, how mm -hmm. did that happen? So in the animal manager, all of these columns that have the arrows by them are sortable. Say, so, and so that includes images. And so right now we're, you can see it's got the little gold up arrow, which means we're sorting by animal id we can click on image to sort by image and you might wonder what does it mean to sort by image i mean is using colors or what what it's doing is just sorting the image is sorting all the animals into those with images and without so the first click is going to now it's pointing a down arrow it's going to show us the animals with images first okay. but if we click it again it reverses the sort so now it's putting the animals without images first okay and 
you know, that with that uh, ordering, you can kind of keep the ones you add images to keep going to the bottom of the list and you, it leaves the ones you still have to do at the top. Right. Okay. That's easy. Unfortunately, I usually don't take my laptop out to the snake room. It's in another building uh, on our mm -hmm. property here. This would be much easier to do on a laptop what you're doing than it would be on the phone, I think. So I, I need to experiment with that and find out. So if we were to put this browser into a responsive design, then an iPhone 8 would look something like this. Yeah. And yeah. so you could, you know, this is what it would look like to sort your animals and you could still touch that. I don't know if that's even showing up and it, it would is. look different on the phone, but you can slide over if you needed to. Now, something people may not know is on the mobile phone, the, 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 the the real estate estate we call it this the content on the screen is it's so limited so it's very precious which one thing you can do is you can if you decide you know what i've got i really want to see maybe even temporarily i want to see the genetics i want to see the genetics not the title so you can actually pop open this little this little column uh customizer and yeah. you can go down to tra traits and you could drag the traits column up to the top and now you're seeing traits there instead of the title or you could say you know that's taking up space and i don't want to see it at all and you could deselect it it's going to remember those preferences for your phone separately than from your desktop so you can customize it one way for your phone and one way for your desktop yeah i like that but okay okay man that's, that's powerful all. now you can also of course you can see the gallery view which is going to show might be nicer if we if we put our images first well we only have one image in here but that's what that looks like and then we have the the card view which is kind of in between it's got a lot of details um less photo more details but not so much like the table and you can click on you know this is kind of a nice way to manage you know if you're looking things up you can yeah. like I said, a lot of information expand it to see the details just different options a lot of our pages on the website now have these view modes and you typically it's well on the phone we may have the card option on a desktop we're going to have the table and we're going to have the grid so just different ways yeah. to interact with the data well well that's handy because on a phone like you say there's limited real estate there and to use your finger and push one side to the other uh sometimes touch the wrong thing and you know, everything disappears <laughs> so that that's nice and now that you've got your breeders in the system you get the benefit of you know users who are looking at your store have more content to interact with they're, they're getting to look at the adults that you're using to produce your animals so that's all really good for your presence um, but we start to unlock these other really cool features. And the one we just launched a few weeks ago is breeding plans. Yeah. Now I was, ex I was excited to see that you hadn't added any breeding plans yet, because that's going to give us a chance to set up a couple of plans that, you know, hypothetical plans perhaps for the season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um what I did, I, I have, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 or so that have already been pairing. And so I mm -hmm. brought those with me in a notebook and uh, and I wanted to learn how to do this with you. So I didn't I didn't jump in and do any of this yet. OK, so the way we built breeding plans is that the first step after getting your breeders in the system, although actually you can even add them within this and I'll show how you are going to be work. You're going to activate a set of breeders that you're working with this season because you might have 300 adult animals, but maybe you're only going to pair 100 of them. And so in order to. Uh, make a list of those animals you want to pair and and not have others there as well kind of for the completeness like you said earlier with the tape you know we're going to choose the animals that are actually going to be getting bred right now um so let's start by uh maybe you could tell me a couple animals on this list that you do plan on and i can look them up if you want me to search for them or we could pick a few that you can see here what about if i gave you an id number okay and that works uh, so uh, 127 is a female Okay. That's her. And I'll be breeding her to male 131. Or I already Excellent. Have. 131. Okay. So I like that, how you have that short number. You can tell me if a customer on the phone called you and said, Hey, Tom, I'm interested in 127. That's a really easy way to communicate. I mean, I love QR. You might have a bunch of black pastel banana type combos, but at 127 is unambiguous. A QR code can also serve the same purpose if you're in your reptile room. But I couldn't tell you a QR code over the phone, but I can say 127. So I like right. that. Right. Okay. So we could go ahead and add, what do you say you're going to pair to 131? 131. Okay. So we could go ahead and add 131 as an active breeder up here. But instead, I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is the breeding plan, we can look at it from the perspective of your females or your males. We don't have any males activated yet. We have this one female. 
So I'm going to go add a sire here with this plus, and I am going to look. Oh, and and of course, right now it's showing me the activated males, but there are, we didn't activate any yet. So I'm going to click Add Active, and I'm going to click one, Type 131 Orange Stream Cypress. Okay, so I got that male, and there we go. I selected it, and now the system is showing us this tentative pairing. It's not saved yet, but it's saying, okay, we're we're looking to pair this male to this female. Right now, it's set to private. And do you want these to be? If we add a few of these, do you want me to make them? Yeah. You want to your your eyes only, or do you want people to start to be able to see this? Let, let's make it public. Okay, cool. So we're going to click on public, um, and the calculator's already run this uh, combination for us. We've integrated the cal our morph calculator, which was recently improved too, um, and we can see all the combos and probabilities associated with those. That's beautiful. And so. You know, you might just be playing around on your phone on the way to, you know, on you're on the train on the way to work or something. And so you're just quickly adding, you're taking your active breeders and pairing them, looking at the outcomes and, can, and going back and canceling. But because you've already thought this through, we're just going to save it. Now, is there, there a it place, is. is there a place there to put um, like copulation or breeding dates or? Hmm. Great question. So now that we've saved the pairing. You can see, you know, in, we're in the female view. So females are first and the ma males are on the right. And there's, we can see it's public. If we wanted to look by males, we click there. Okay. But let's click on the, if we click on this row, it's going to, we've already saved it, but now we're going to open the pairing back up again. Right here, we've got a section for activity history coming soon. So that's okay. what you're asking about. Yeah. So you, yeah. but we kind of have, have kind of indicated, hey, here, we're going to be allowing readers to just record the pairing event, the lock or the, follicle size and some other things here maybe maybe shed um so we're going to be working on this very soon and uh it'll be added right here we'll integrate it into a bunch of places in the system but initially i expect it'll be here where you can just click this button and save the activity and then we'll have like the history here in addition what's going to be really neat is once you've recorded the the date of the locks or uh, sorry pairings on this page we'll have some dates and, and and order things in a way that if it'll help you rotate because let's say you've got three males that you're pairing to this female uh it'll we'll have some sort here so that the next pairing you should do would be the first one something like that so it would quickly yeah. what do you think about that uh, that sounds great um typically this is the only female that this male will be but there are other mm. females that i have the one female sort of my top end is three females per male I don't want to, you know, overuse mm -hmm. them, um, mm -hmm. but but that's very common, I think, in our industry to use one male for multiple females, and mm -hmm. uh, so I like that. I like that. If we were on a mobile phone, this is actually what it would look like. It might be I should have maybe waited till we added a couple, but uh, instead of having the table view, we show card view, and the nice thing is we actually fold up all the the animals being paired to under the primaries. We call this the primary, and we call these the secondaries because in this case, if we flip over to male view. Now you can see the male and the females that that uh, he is going to. Okay. But this will provide a really nice. This is probably the view you're going to have in your hand in your yeah. reptile room, and we can rotate these through based on the the order of pairing. Right. Well, you know, at at the beginning of the year, before I even start pairing, uh, that will be valuable to have it in the male view. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and once I hit three females under him, then I'm done with him. I'm not going to add any more females to him. So that would you know, again, I don't have to have a separate sheet of paper, a separate notebook. There it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. let's see. Let's see how quickly we can add a few more pairings. So you just feed them to me, and I will. All right. Would you like add, to let's females first? How about, yeah. Let's give me a list of the female ID numbers. Okay, just do females to start with. Okay, one twenty-eight. Mm -hmm. Yep, super gravel. Mm -hmm. Seven seventy-four. Okay. 68, 69, okay. 27. Okay. I'm yeah. going to do something. I wonder, I want to show another trick. This is going to be advanced, Tom. Are you ready? Are you holding on to your chair? I'm holding we're on. Gonna, we're going to go back to our animal manager. We're going to go to our not for sale animals. And the way that we track the animals that are on your breeding plan right now are with tags that's a little secret it's it's you don't need to know that 
But what, what's happening is every time we're adding a, an animal, we're giving it a tag, Breeders 2023. So one another way that we could go through and add animals, if I filter down to your, the Tom Harbin animals here, is that we could actually, what percent of your animals are you going to be breeding that we have imported? Less than 50%. Some of those are grow outs. So it, it could even be 35 to 40%. Got it. So we won't go through this, but I'll just show this is an alternative way to do what we're doing. If you were going to breed, if you just knew and you you could go down this list, I mean, do you know, like, can you tell me if you're going to be breeding uh, like 84? Yes. Yes. Um, yep. 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 Yes. Yes. Yes and yes. Yes. Might as well keep going. I think we're getting close. Well, <laughs> let's stop there. Okay. okay, let's. We could we could do them all, and, and you know, it, this would probably we it probably take you ten minutes, I bet, to go through. But let me show you. We're selecting these, and now we're going to go to bulk action, and we're going to change tag and see breeders twenty twenty three. What it's saying, it's gray right now, which means some of the things we selected have it, and some don't. So I'm going to click it again, and it's gold now, and that's going to mean it's going to apply it to all of them. If I clicked it again, it would take it away and then we could remove that tag but we're going to add it to all of those and we're going to save okay so it updated 22 records and so if we go back to breeding plan boom look at that we we just activated all of those females so that's an alternative way that we could very quickly now what would be really cool tom is if we what we need the feature we need to add is that in the import we need um, a column for tags we don't have that yet because then in our spreadsheet we could have just put breeders 2023 and all those there you know that that would be an alternative way to get that data in there but anyway there's just different ways but there we go we've got you know now we have uh looks like 24 females let's add some males now um which which method do you prefer do you want to go the one by one or do you want to go to the list um now some of these i have not determined which male is going yet i'm still in my planning stage on some of these girls so the banana inchy clown um i haven't bred her yet and i don't have my list of um of animals here she will be going to my cypress yellow belly clown i don't know the id number okay let's just type in uh maybe there 150 maybe there he is yep so we used we just searched by title as opposed to searching by id that time okay select them and there we go there we go check out the outcomes that's going to be fun there and we'll save it. If we were to go, what percent of your uh, male animals are you going to, that we've imported, are you going to be breeding? Probably about 20 of them. So if I, again, filter down to, you know, the TH animals, and then I filter by sex, using that trick we learned earlier, if I click on sex, we're sorting by sex. So the using the trick we saw earlier, we can click on sex to sort it, and we click on sex again to reverse sort, which puts the males first. So yeah. now we could go down and see, I mean, how many males do you have? You have about, there's 50 per page. So you've got about 45 males in here. So okay. it sounds like about half of those you're going to breed. Well, why don't we just flip through and activate some of those? Okay. Uh, hurricane hit, hit DG, uh, special hit monsoon. Yes. And yes. Okay. So we finished the males. All right. We're going to use the same trick as before. Bulk action, change tag, click once to make it gold and save. There we go. <clears throat> Go back to breeding, and uh, now we can see all the males we've added. And we got 20, 24 on this page, and actually went to the second page and got uh, three more there. Tom, when you think about your breeding plans, it's beneficial to look at this both from a male or a fe and a female point of view. But in your mind, conceptually, do you think do you is there one way you tend to primarily think about it? putting males to females or females to males except for a couple of my projects i've got multiple males and so it gives me some latitude you know um mm -hmm. but the first thing i consider is is how much male power do i have because if you talk to enough breeders you're gonna everybody that's done a lot of this has killed males by overusing them you know mm. that's, that's unfortunately they just if you if you bring them to eight females six eight females young ones they just mm -hmm. never start eating again they die so i look at my male power first and Mm -hmm. what are his limitations that's my first thing and then there's going to be some females that i just choose not to breed this year maybe they didn't put their weight back on you know like i wanted them to so 
there's a number of things that I consider, but I, I like to look at my mails first. Mm -hmm. um, so you, if you were, if you didn't already have the plan written down on a piece of paper, when you were forming that plan, you know, were you thinking, okay, I've got this mail and now which females do I want to put into, or would you be going the other way? Yes. You know, and, and the other part of that is too, which I'm certain that every breeder that is, is at least a bit savvy, you know, um, we all monitor the market. You know, what does the market want? And if the market is, is sort of dried up on a certain combo or whatever, I'm not going to make any more of those. I'm, I'm going to use that female or male for something else. And I don't want to make 30 of, of anything because I don't want to saturate the market this year. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things, uh, some other things that I would consider too, um, whether to retire a female or to uh, give her the year off or, and see what the markets, the marketplace is going to demand. So a cool feature would be somehow in here, being able to quickly see if you had bred her last year, perhaps. Yes. yes. As small as my group is, I can just about tell you when the last time they pooped, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that looks like a lot, but it's really not when you're in, in there with them every day. But yes, mm -hmm. that would be a valuable thing to, what did she do for me last year? When did she lay eggs? Uh, of course, as you get to know your females, they lay their eggs almost the same month every year. So that would be mm -hmm. nice to know. When mm -hmm. did she ovulate? Mm -hmm. When did she lay eggs? You know, uh, when's the last year she actually produced eggs for me? Did she resorb last year? That's a big thing that, that we have to watch. Um, females that resorb uh, and don't go to fully develop uh, ova, it, it decreases their reproductive capacity oftentimes for a year or two. So, so those things sort of go into your planning. If I know that, you know, female 141 resorbed last year, I'm going to definitely give her the year off, let her ovaries heal back up and get back to normal. Now, when you start pairing these animals up, you know, would you, if you didn't already have that plan, would you be taking your Batman and then looking at your females to see who you yeah. put her to or the other yeah. way around? I would, I would take that Batman. Well, I can do it both ways. And I really mm -hmm. need to do it from the male perspective first, because I am raising up a, a Batman number two right now, mm -hmm. but right now he's my Batman. So I'm not going to wear mm -hmm. him out, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, uh, when Batman number two comes online, then that'll give me some more latitude. And, uh, but I, I really do start with my males first. And, and so mm -hmm. how many females can I breed this year to Mr. Batman, you know? So, okay. So who, who in your plan right now, Let's see if we've got the females entered in that you want to put the Batman to. I am probably going to put him to, um, let me see if I've already used him. I have not used him yet. Um, I'm going to put him to uh, the Courtney clown. There she is. And I'm also going to put him to that banana Mojave orange dream clown female. That one, you know, spot nose has been red hot this year. People are looking for spot nose. So that's what you get out of your Batman, the bat, the uh, spot nose and leopard. So there probably will be one more. I've got a banana inchy clown female that I think I will put him to also. Yeah, there she is. Mm -hmm. And that may do it for him. He, he may mm -hmm. see three girls. Mm -hmm. Got the three now. Okay. I like and that. Okay. Now, one feature, one thing we can do is you start to, you know, you want to monitor how much you're using the males. The next to, you know, obviously next to each animal, we've got a, a pink or a blue square that indicates the sex, right? Yeah. But we in that inside that square, in the context of the breeding plans, we show how many times that animal is currently paired. So now we can see the Batman's been paired three times, and then we yeah. can see that, uh, you know, these clowns are paired once, and this banana and she is paired twice so far and if we wanted to sort our males we could sort them by most assigned and of course the batman's right at the top because we haven't filled out the rest or we could sort to least assigned and so we'd start we could start working on these males that we haven't paired yet so those are some different ways to yeah um yeah, yeah. and this of course the same thing on the we can see the females we've paired a couple of these animals a few times so that's a tool that exists right now of course we want to make those potentially public. Another great feature of breeding plans already is that we have this outcomes button. And when we click that, it shows the distributions of all the combos that we could get from that plan, right? And so the first column is going to show us, now we haven't put very many pairings in here yet. It says we've paired four females to three males so far. So it's only, I'm not sure how many pairs that is. I don't know that we would call that 12 necessarily, but anyway, we can see that we, if, if that's all we paired, 
And if all of those females went, then we would expect, and if the clutch size was six on average, kind of defaulted a reasonable number for ball pythons, you can tune this for to some different values. But uh, we would expect to get two clowns, two visual clowns. And we can see that we could, we have four different pairings that could produce that clown right. or a, an a exact clown. So that's, those are some of the things we can see here. You can also sort what are some of the, you know, richest genetics we could get. You got a 20% chance, or a, yeah, well, you got a one out of five chance of hitting Batman, Banana, Mojave, Orange Dream. And it's from that pairing, the Batman, ba Banana, Mojave, OD clown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Can you think of any other features you'd like to see on this page that would help as you develop a plan and check the, all the outcomes and then go back? Because you said a minute ago, you know, you wouldn't want to produce 30 of some particular right. outcome. Right. And that's that's what we could kind of derive from the sort by expected count. No, that that predictability or at least, you know, that helps you think think through that. Now, I can't write off think of anything else to put on that. Does Morph Market take into consideration? Um, allelic genes which ones are allelic to one another like clown and cryptic it does okay mm -hmm. okay all mm -hmm. right all right so that's good i mean that that eliminates you know that uh crossover or or um or inaccuracy that looks good it, yeah. it would be neat we would like to add some metrics within here that would maybe show you the frequency of that animal in the marketplace right now we could also put some metrics eventually around market value i mean of course you're not just breeding to make the maximum dollars and you have certain goals you have you have you know you may be wanting to go away that you think is strategic that the current prices don't reflect but nevertheless more data is is beneficial right or could right. be beneficial right so those are not available right now but those are potentially in the future right yeah yeah Maybe ex extensions maybe the last thing we'll show is um let's imagine that in this pairing that there was an ovulation at that point, you know, while we're not tracking these other activities right now, what you can do is you can go ahead and click on create group. And when you say create group, we call it a group because it could be a litter or a clutch, but it's an offspring group, which in this case is a uh, is a clutch. It initializes, it gives it a breeding ID. It already knows the categories, ball pythons. It's got the sire and dam. It does support if you wanted to plug in multiple males for a dual sire clutch. Um, and then, you know, right now, if it just ovulated, we would just save. But if we already had some like egg details, we could put that in here, date of birth. And then finally, we could create offspring. And so when you get to the point of um, hatching eggs, you could say, well, there was three males and four females. And it's going to initialize based on the genetics of the parents. It's going to make a guess at the most likely trade outcomes. Of course, that's not they're not all just clowns, but you would go in here and tweak it. So you could add a gene, you could yeah. change to het clown if that was appropriate or whatever and refresh title. And the cool thing is then, Tom, when um, when these animals are established, or even before they're established, because we have a maturity of pre-established now, um, all you've got to do is put a price on that and set it and change the status to for sale. And now you've, you're listing, you know, of course you add a photo um, like we did before, but, and then you've got your listing and you've got the lineage associated with it and other details that could be useful to buyers. So. You kind of uh, you did work up front, but then you end up saving yourself time in the end, and and that dumps straight into my morph market store. Exactly, okay. because these are the, we just created animals. In fact, if we go over here back to your animal manager, you're gonna see uh, those those clowns that were just added. They were their animals have been created. They're just not for sale right now. But as soon as we change them to for sale, they're gonna show up in your for sale tab. They're gonna show up in the listings. Now, right now, the parent, that public pairing we created, let's go over, go to ball pythons. Within ball, you're familiar with this page where it shows yes. the index of all the genetics, right? For listings. Well, now we have projects index, and that allows users to browse all of those pairings and clutches and litters that haven't, haven't yet converted into, into listings. Ah. So we could, you know, we moved the button from up there down to here. Now you can see all the projects by clicking here if we, if we didn't care about genetics. And look at that. There's that pairing that we just published, that we made public a few minutes ago, the Orange Stream Cypress. And we could click in here and see. And now users can actually browse this uh, and see, get excited about what you're producing. That's exciting. That is really exciting. And so this is already functional, what you're showing me now. 
We are live on the website. This is okay. Okay. Completely live. The other thing you can encourage uh, your your followers to do is that they can go over here and click this heart. Actually, let's go down. Let's let's add a filter for Tom Harvin reptiles. So we're just going to see your stuff here. The little heart is to save a search. So we're yeah. going to save a search. We're going to call it Tom Harvin projects. And if I wanted to, I could turn on mobile alerts. I could turn on email alerts, or I could just save the search. I'm going to go ahead and turn on email alerts and i'm going to save it and now i'm going to get an alert every time an email every time you publish a pairing i can stay up to date with what you're doing that's great that, that is can great. be found over here and you can see our searches there actually showed up as a listing search that's a bug <laughs> okay <laughs> we'll, we'll make a note of that saved search went to listing should have been a project search but tom is there anything before we end this really fruitful call is there anything that you could share with other breeders that tips or tricks that you've learned about Morph Market that, that you have made you more successful? The thing that draws people in the most is good pictures. And um, even though I have some good pictures and some poor pictures, good descriptions, add extra information, a short video. I have a bunch of people, they say, hey, I see your picture, but can you send me a, a quick video? You know, and, and sometimes I say, oh brother, here we go, you know, but, um, to put that work in ahead, it doesn't take much time. So I think the more that we can present to the person at the point of first view, uh, they're going to say, wow, he's put a lot of work into this. And so I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, so um, accurate descriptions, um, little videos, good, clear pictures and, um, and, and, and keep your morph market up to date. When I say, you know, I saw one at the show uh, Saturday and a guy contacted me Saturday night. I had not deleted it yet. He said, Hey, I want to buy that snake. So, you know, keep it up to date because it frustrates people. I don't want to raise questions for people. I want people to know that I'm on top of my game and, you know, we're, we're giving good information. So all those things, you know, I think help me look at the events, you know, uh, and I love how they have, you know, dovetailed together. People can see exactly where my booth is going to be in Tinley, you know, and uh, so the more I promote that, then the more people are going to be able to find me. Do you? We covered a lot of ground today, and we did answer some of your questions. But is there anything else that you thought of? Hey, I'm going to ask John how to do such and such. Any questions you had that I could speak to? No, not yet. I, we've covered a lot of ground. In fact, it's just a <laughs> touch overload, you know. Uh, <laughs> but but you were very patient, very clear with all that. So I feel like I can execute anything that you've uh, shown today. And is there any feature that outside of the things we discussed, is there any other feature you would request or you'd like to see on the site? You know, I, I'm really excited about uh, point of sale. Uh, although what you showed today, we're going to populate all the offspring. I'm going to identify those by tagging, you know, their genetic traits. I'm going to price them. And so, you know, once it goes on Mark market, people have all the information that I have. So um, mm -hmm. I think once we get to that place, I think we're going to be, you know, the other thing that I think may be good someday is either barcodes or QRs, you know, on the tubs. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I know we talked about that and that's, you know, maybe a possibility. Uh, also, maybe to be able to generate tub um, labels, you know, on the mm -hmm. uh, the label writer, Dymo label writer, I think mm -hmm. could be good. Um, Otherwise, I've got to go to another application to generate that, you know. Uh, so I, mm -hmm. I think that could be a good thing too. Are there three to? Are there a couple of breeders that you small breeders that are kind of are, are earlier along in their process to where you are that you would want to give a shout out to that you want to you would point people to pay attention to? Yeah, I'm, I will give a shout out to two, and uh, one of them is uh, familial. But uh, my oldest son and his wife, Josh and Alicia, they are Herpin Harbins. She has really gotten serious into the Western hog nose. And so you guys be watching her for bringing some killer stuff out. So Herpin Harbins. So this is going to be passed down to another generation. My grandkids are already doing uh, Cressy Geckos. And uh, so be watching out for these Harbins, okay? Uh, the other one I'd like to give a shout out to because she really promotes me a lot is uh, Full Throttle Reptiles. And she's a Mark Market user, uh, Alyssa Leonard. And uh, mm -hmm. we set up at most shows um, uh, in the net same neighborhood. And so uh, uh, those guys are working really hard. They're bringing a lot of good stuff to the market. And the thing I like about them, not just because they're family and friends, but they're educators. And uh, to me, that is one of the things that's incumbent on us. And if we're just salesmen 
uh, we're not selling a very good product, but my goal, and I know these two people, their goals when they go to shows is to educate people. And uh, that, that just creates goodwill. It creates success, uh, healthy animals. Uh, people are not disappointed. Uh, so education, and these guys are educators. And so I think that's one thing that I appreciate about them. Well, uh, speaking of educators, uh, thank you for being uh, the Professor Harbin and uh, <laughs> going out into the academia and spreading the practical hands on knowledge, you know, that you've gotten and uh doing all the veterinarian care that you provide and um i love how even today like you're weaving in husbandry tips into our conversation so it's great to have a experienced you know well educated and such a friendly um person in our industry people are always talking about the reptile people and and uh and and saying negative things about it but uh tom you are one of the the bright bright lights i think in our industry so it's been a lot of fun to talk with you, and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. You're you're more than welcome, and I this has been fun. I hope, I, and I know it's going to be very helpful to the folks that take a chance to watch this and uh, and learn the power of Mark Market. Mm -hmm.